Welcome to the Sunday night services of Lakewood Baptist Temple. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have the Schmidt family, uh, well, actually just Brother Michael uh, here with us tonight, and he's going to be preaching for us. He's going to be showing us a video about the ministry that God has called them to, and, uh, and, and I, I am greatly looking forward to the service this evening. I hope that you've prepared your heart for what God wants to do, how he wants to speak to you and uh, let's get ready for that right now. Even I uh, hope that, that you've already spent some time with him, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll pray right now and ask the Lord to bless the services this evening for God to do a great work uh, tonight. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and ask that you would bless your people this evening as, as we listen to your word preached. May it affect our hearts in a mighty way. I pray, God, that you would help the song service as Brother Jeff leads the singing to stir us, Lord, and prepare us for the preaching of your word. I pray that you'd forgive us of sin and help us to set everything in our minds and in our hearts aside. And uh, Lord God, would you use the missionary presentation, the video tonight, uh, to, to burden our hearts so once again for missions and specifically the field of Brazil. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for uh, Brother Schmidt as, as he preaches, that you'll use the message that he preaches uh, to, to stir us tonight and uh, help us, Lord, in, in the area of missions, in the area of being uh, concerned for souls. And God, we just ask that you bless in a mighty way. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all stand up. Brother Jeff is going to come and lead us in a couple of songs, and let's sing praises unto the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's sing the song, In My Heart There Rings a Melody. On that first verse now, I have a song that Jesus
Amen. As I said earlier, uh, it is a blessing and a privilege uh, to have Brother Michael Schmidt, missionary to Brazil, with us this evening. And uh, we're going to watch a video, a video presentation of their, uh, their mission field that they are called to. And so you listen in on that and, and watch it. Let it affect your heart. Uh, let let uh, their burden become your burden as well. And uh, let it speak to your heart. And then we're going to have a, uh, a song special. And then Brother Michael's going to come and preach the Word of God to us. And so uh, let your heart be prepared. For, and and, uh, and let, uh, let the video uh, speak to you. And, uh, and, and, and let your, your heart burn once again for missions. Uh, then, uh, then listen to the song special and let it prepare your heart. And, uh, and then listen to the, the powerful message uh, preached by, by Brother Michael tonight. And I know that it's going to bless your heart. I know uh, that God will speak to you. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's tune in to the uh, video presentation at this time. And then we'll have the song special. And then Brother Michael's going to come and preach the word of God to us. Brazil is a country of astounding beauty and diversity. Their range of landscapes are vast and complex. From the incredible Amazon Basin, the Pantanal wetlands, the mighty Iguazu Falls, the endless expanses of valleys and peaks, to the breathtaking coastlines and beaches. It contains over 60% of the Amazon rainforest and has the greatest variety of animals, plants, and freshwater fish in the world. Brazil is also the fifth largest nation by population, covering nearly half of the continent of South America. Though the predominant language is Portuguese, there are over 180 native languages spoken because it is home to more uncontacted people groups than anywhere on the planet, having over 240 tribes. It is also a country saturated with religious and spiritual activity. For the past four centuries, Catholicism has been the overwhelmingly dominant practice, making it the largest Catholic nation in the world. In the last three decades, however, Brazil has also grown to be the largest Pentecostal nation in the world. Pentecostals run the fifth largest TV network in Brazil. Their health and wealth messages resonate with many who are seeking a life without poverty. A survey by the Pew Forum found 64% said they have received direct revelations from God, and 80% said they have either received or witnessed an exorcism. In response to declining numbers to Pentecostalism, Catholicism has embraced a charismatic Christianity in an effort to make the best of both worlds, yet creating even more spiritual confusion and a much more complex religious situation to the point that even among most churches carrying the name Baptist, they are charismatic in doctrine and practice. Though many started with the truth, they too shifted with the culture, now preaching strange doctrines and a gospel of faith plus works, leaving many cities religious but lost. Though Brazil may look largely Christian, when you peel back the layers, you find it is a false version. Many have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. They are searching for change. They are searching for a new life. God has called my family and I to serve Him in the country of Brazil. For the last eight and a half years, my wife and I have been privileged to serve on staff at South Knoll Baptist Church under the leadership of Jeremiah Metzinger. In the summer of 2018, my church took a mission trip to Brazil. It was on a Monday morning when I was reading and praying before the day got started and God impressed on my heart that we were to come here. I was kind of taken back by that at first because I love our church. I loved working with my pastor and working with the youth and I really had no desire to leave. So I asked the Lord to make it clear by making it evident to my pastor, my wife, and the brewers. Well, after three days, the burden hadn't gone away so I decided to talk with my pastor about it. And he said that not long after we had arrived, he began to sense that this was gonna happen. And then just the night before, while he and missionary Tom Brewer were talking, they asked if we could come as well. 
we decided to take three months to pray about it and, and seek counsel and make sure we each still felt direction in this. Well, God continued to make it more and more clear to the point that I knew to not come, I would be in complete sin. So in mid-October, we surrendered and God began to work right away. For instance, we put our house on the market and after a few days began to get offers. And two and a half weeks later, it sold. And our realtor that helped us sell the house was the same one who seven and a half years earlier helped us buy it. And at that time, he was not open to the gospel. But this time, the day before we sold the house, I shared the gospel again and, and he received Christ as his savior. How has it became available for us to live in during the transition at no cost? And as we began looking for tickets to take a three month survey trip in January, we found them 60% cheaper than just a couple months earlier when we took our mission trip with our church. As he arrived in Atapua, in the city of Hondonia, God continued to work, confirming to us this is exactly where he wants us. The Lord knit the hearts of the brewers and our family together. We got to spend hours learning the culture and talking missions philosophy and talking about the vision for the future. Our family acclimated quickly and our hearts fell even more in love with these people, especially our kids, who the people love seeing. The Lord gave great ability to begin learning the language as I was able to do my first devotion in Portuguese after six weeks and preach and conduct services after 11 weeks. A thorough plan of mentorship with the Brewers has been established. That plan is to minister alongside the Brewers in the following ways. Preaching and teaching weekly in children's classes and adult services. Working in the Bible Institute and translating training materials. Assisting and directing the annual summer camp being involved in the discipleship and soul winning of the church, and to continue towards fluency in Portuguese. Though the many years of service by missionaries Tom and Cindy Brewer have resulted in churches started and a number of men trained for ministry, there is yet an enormous amount of work that remains. There are still many cities and towns and villages with no gospel witness at all, and many missionaries here are at or past retirement age. One Baptist missions agency said that since 1992, the number of missionaries they have in Brazil has dropped by 45%. So with the retiring missionary force and rampant spiritual confusion, there is a great need for more missionaries, for theological clarity, for evangelism, for discipleship, for church planning, and for the training of Brazilian pastors. They need help to see through the falsehood and become passionate about sharing the gospel. We understand that we cannot reach Brazil in our lifetime. So our plan, according to 2 Timothy 2.2, is to train men to train others to create an unending chain to reach the road of the gospel. We need your help because we cannot do this without your prayers. We need your help because we cannot do this without God's people giving. We need your help because many are living in spiritual darkness. Would you commit to helping out today any way the Lord lays it on your heart? Will you be part of seeing lives transformed in Brazil?
glad to be here. Uh, I know I don't get to see many of you, uh, which is really a bummer. It's just the nature of things, but I'm I'm glad to be here. The privilege that this really opened up with the COVID thing, and uh, we had some, some meetings canceled. I'm so thankful we get to be here with you. Again, we're the Schmitz to Brazil, and uh, we're going to be going to and working with Tom and Cindy Brewer. They've been there for 40 years. As you saw, veteran missionaries, they've been praying for eight years for God to send a couple there, and uh, that that happens to be us. That's how it all worked out. And so that's where we're heading, uh, to the Northwest Amazon Basin. I have five children. Again, they're not here uh, with me, but I have five children, uh, Caleb, Joshua, Jonathan, Anna, and Grace. And they're all between three and ten. And that's fun just in itself. And uh, I think the Lord really has prepared us for the, f- the, for the field and for this area. And so we're excited to, to be going there. And if you uh, jump on our website, schmitztobrazo.com, you can see uh, more about our family. And then you can also see updates every month we put out uh, what God's done, where we've been going. We've been traveling on the road for uh, 11 months now. And uh, by the grace of God, we, we hit 69% last month. And I, I, it's looking like, even despite all of that's going on with the canceled meetings, I, I think by November we're going to be done traveling, uh, worst case. And so I, I'm praising God because there's seven of us in a 220 cubic foot area called a Honda Odyssey. And that is not fun to, to be in, but it is just the nature of the beast. And uh, so we're thank, thankful that God is speeding us along and for all the friendships we've been able to make on the road and ones we hope to continue as we get to the field. And really, if you know the brewers at all know about them, of course, you saw a little bit of the ministry in the video there. Uh, They have uh, a couple of different houses that churches can come in when they do come in and kind of stay in there for short term. A couple weeks wouldn't be bad. More than that would probably not be great or not very big. They're Brazilian made houses. And so uh, churches can come out there and visit. And uh, get to see all that, and it's just neat. All, all, my wife and I are just excited and dreaming about the the types of mission trips that churches churches could take out there, and it could be the lower cost and all those things. It's just a really neat ministry. They have the Bible Institute there. They have the summer camp ministry there, and the brewers are in their seventies, and that's why they've been praying for eight years for God to send a couple over there. And uh, and we, and then as you saw in the video, you see how the Lord worked it out to where not only did I feel that way, my pastor felt that way, but they felt that way all outside of each other. You know, I put out four fleeces and God just like, I don't care if you put four fleeces out, I'll answer all of them. And that's what happened. And so we're going to be heading there. And I, again, I, I, I trust that you could pray for us and that you could go on our website and get uh, information and uh, sign up for our prayer letter. There's like 10 ways to sign up for it on the website. So you do. So go ahead and do that. And we really appreciate that. I mean, the money, money will get us there, but it's not necessarily going to keep us there. There's a spiritual attacks that take place. There's doors that need to open. Paul talked about that many times in the scriptures about praying for a door to open. And we, that's still true today. We need that. And so please uh, pray for us as well. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, but for tonight, we're going to be in Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, th- this is a passage that um, I've worked on, uh, worked through quite a bit. I-, I-, I love this passage because it communicates so much the need of missions and when I say missions, I don't just mean missionaries. I mean missions. I mean what, what you do here in this town. So I want you to see in Romans chapter 10, the three groups of lost people that are out there, why they're that way and, and what we do with them. Well, how do we approach these different groups? So in Romans 10, look at w- with me in verse 14. It says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We'll just stop there for that, but I want to ask you a couple questions as we dig into this. Here's the first one. If the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, if that's what it is, which we believe it is, then why doesn't everyone who hears it believe it? If the gospel is so simple that even a child can understand it, then why are so many lost? Why are so many confused about this? Why is the country that I'm going to, 85, it was 85% Catholic and now it's down to 60, but why is there so much confusion with the Pentecost movement and the Catholic movement? Why, why is there so much confusion? 
And what happens to those who never accept the gospel? I think even greater than that, what happens to those who have rejected and keep rejecting the gospel? What happens to those people? Well, the Apostle Paul answers these questions and more as you go through the book of Romans. But when we get to chapter 10, for it to have the punch that I believe it, it, it merits and that Paul wanted to have, you really have to buy into three basic facts about humanity that Paul has already established. And it starts off in chapter 1. And so go ahead and turn to chapter 1 real quick. And I want you to look at verse, verse 18. This is the first thing. If chapter 10 is going to have the punch it's meant to have, you have to buy into three things. And the first one is found in verse 18, and that is all people know there's a God. They, they know that. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Why? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Do you notice what men have? They have the truth. And what do they do with it? Well, they... They don't treat it the way that the truth should be treated, they, right? They, they suppress that. They, they hold that down. The truth about what, you might think? Well, look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. It's clear in them. Well, how is it clear? Well, God showed it unto them. You see, what did God show them? Verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. It's not confusing. It's not it, it's, it's obvious. It's, it's like the argument. Uh, we believe that um, everything came from nothing. Really? That's what, that's what atheist says? Everything came from nothing? No, 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 no. It came from something. I know it's clearly seen. It, it's obvious. That's what he's saying there. It's manifest. It's clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power in God. And so, so what's the problem then? Well, what's Paul's conclusion? Well, when they knew God, verse 21... They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now, what Paul is getting at there is that God has revealed himself to everyone that has ever come into the world. He's revealed himself to them. It, it's super obvious. Many of you have probably heard of the Aka Indians. They are a remote tribe of cannibals that uh, many of them came to Christ. If you didn't know that later on, it's a pretty awesome story. But you would, may remember them from End of the Spear, where Jim Elliott, Nate St. Roger Darien, they, they went down there and they were trying to make contact with this tribe and they were trying to share the gospel with them. And, and after a while, they made successful contact and they were flying over. They were doing the basket thing. Well, eventually, they landed down there. And the first day was okay. Second day, they ended up being murdered, if you, if you know the story. And it's a tragic thing. But if you didn't know this, this is amazing that many of them came to Christ later on. In fact, I have the testimony of one of them. Listen to what he says. I've noticed that many of you Westerners think that we ran around killing and eating people because we didn't know better. He said, that's not true. We always knew there was a deity of some kind and that he was very displeased with what we were doing. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? We're talking about a man who grew up with no technology, no outside influence, in a pagan area who's grown up in the traditions of eating and killing people, and yet even he knew this isn't right. Something's wrong about this. How about Helen Keller, born both blind and deaf? If you look at her account where Dr. Brooks is sitting there with Miss Sullivan, and they're translating, to, uh, they're communicating with her through finger pressures, and they're trying to get across the idea of God to her. The account it goes like, as the idea of God came across to Miss Keller, it says, here's what she said. Oh, I know him. I have known him a long, long time. I just didn't know what to call him. Isn't that incredible? What are you getting at? Here's what I'm getting at. That even in the heart of someone who has no eyes to see or ears to hear, listen, God has written himself there. The fact that he is, the, the knowledge that he is, which establishes the fact that atheism is not a natural belief system. It's a learned one. They would have you think otherwise, but it's not. Every culture ever discovered in any part of the world has been religious in some ways. So what I'm saying is there is no one that's born an atheist. Well, no, we're not. And for a while, I used to believe the atheist when he would say, well, I've never believed in God. Matter of fact, I even have some of my immediate family, 
like outside of my kids and stuff. I'm talking about me, family, like my, my parents and things. We're, we're are kind of atheistic. Well, I just don't really know if I buy into that. I, I've never really believed that. And for a while growing up as a teenager, I would believe that. And it really came down to read my Bible through Romans chapter two. And, and here's what God says, um, that God be true in every man of what? This is a liar. And I know that's harsh to hear that, but that's really the reality. I had to come down to, in my own belief, in my own mind, am I going to trust what God says about this, or am I going to trust the testimony of a man or woman who's in rebellion against the God that made him, right? Who's, who's trying to get rid of the knowledge of God. And so the issue isn't, do they know if there's a God? That, that's not the issue that we're dealing with out there. Well, what's the problem then? Well, we already saw that in verse 21. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God. They weren't thankful. They didn't want him in their life. And so they rejected him. So they all know there's a God, but they've all rejected that God. And you see this in verse 25 of Romans 1, who changed the truth of God, look at this, into a lie. Into a lie. And, and what are they serving then in, in its place? Well, creatures, more than, well, you're more than the creator. Do you think it's a coincidence that there's an agenda being pushed that there's a theory for a substitute for a creator called evolution? Do you think it's, it's, it's just, it just happened that men are trying their hardest? No, to, to, to come up with these theories? No, what, what are they doing? They are trying to push the God they know to be out of their life and out of their mind. And the only way they can do that, and the only reason why they do it is verse 28 of Romans 1. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God, where? In their knowledge. They don't want to think about this. What do they do? Well, they come up with something else to think about. They come up with another theory, another way, and they'll lie all about it. Which leads to the third point, that all men are guilty before God. We all know there's a God. We've rejected him, and we stand guilty before him. And we know this. There's none righteous, no, not one. All have come short of the glory of God. And so the fact is, all of humanity is guilty. But it's not because of what we don't know. And it's not because of what we haven't heard yet. We're guilty because of what we already know and what we've done with that. In other words, the innocent native in some remote tribe does not exist. They, they don't exist. And unfortunately, many in our modern day would say, well, wouldn't it be unfair if God were to condemn someone for never hearing about Jesus? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it just be unfair of God? Well, that's not the issue. Well, what's the issue? Well, John chapter 3 already talks about the issue. In three, verse 19, he says, this is the condemnation. Well, what's the condemnation? That light is come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. See, isn't that the issue? And if you look at John 3, 19 closely, you'll notice that when he says light, it's a lowercase l. He's not talking about, oh, Jesus came into the world, and so men reject it. No, he's talking about that God's light, his revelation, his revealing of himself and all of those things, it's already there. But when men saw it, they don't want it. And so they reject it. Why do they reject it? Well, because their deeds are evil. So this is the condemnation. Now, one question you have to deal with when you get into this is what about babies, right? What about mentally challenged? What about those who don't have the capacity? Well, how does God view them? Are they guilty before God? Well, why did Paul say that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven? It's because people hold the truth in their righteousness. They have the mental capacity and ability to discern it and do something with it. And so because of that, God judges them with that. He, Paul even farthers that when you go at Romans 5.13. He says, sin is not imputed. It's not counted where there is no law. So again, do, do the babies, do mentally challenged understand the law? No. Are they guilty? Do they have sinful natures? Absolutely. I've had five children. Of course, I teach them not to sin, right? So th that's in them. They have hearts inclined to sin, but, but is their sin counted in that case? Well, well no, it's, it's not. Okay, so now that you understand that, that foundation, this is why missions is necessary. Because if it all ends up okay in the end, we're, we're, we're Joe Bob on some island. It wouldn't be Joe Bob. It'd be some other crazy indiscernible name. Some guy in some island somewhere, he's never heard about God. He's never heard about Christ. What's going to happen with him? This matters because he already knows there's a creator and he's done something about that and he stands guilty. This is why this matters. And this is why we get into Romans chapter 10. Now go back to chapter 10 because Paul has been working through this foundation we have to have, and now he's going to help us understand the three reasons why many have not turned to the gospel, and what do we do with them? Look at verse 14 again. How then shall they call 
Why do they have to call if, if it's not necessary? Well, they do need to. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Now, I'll, I'll never forget hearing about a pastor was talking and he was mentioning how he was out door knocking. And as he was out there for a while, he, he came to a door of an Iranian man. And as he knocked on the door and he's explaining the gospel, he got through the whole thing. And here's what the guy said. If I believed that, I would go everywhere and tell it. It's pretty convicting, isn't it? Because sometimes we don't don't have that mindset as Christians. That's what he said. I'd go everywhere and tell that. And then he said this. If that is so true, then how come I never heard that in my country? That's a good question, isn't it? See, why, why did he never hear it? nobody told him. Why did nobody tell him? Well, no, nobody, nobody went over there that, or got to him at least. And this is what Paul is establishing. Do you know why many people of the road have not called on Christ? Do you know what it is? Well, because they, they don't believe. But, but, but why don't they believe? Well, they've never even heard of Christ yet in some places. Well, why, they, why have they never heard? Well, because no one's told them. And so I know that's simplistic, but that's what Paul is saying. He says, here's the first reason why many have yet not believed in Christ. And what is it? Well, they haven't heard yet. They just haven't heard yet. There are people all over the world, even in this town, that literally, I believe this, right now would be saved if only they heard the gospel. What's going to fix that? Well, they need a preacher to tell them. Well, I'm not a preacher, you might think. I'm, I'm a church member. I work here. I do this. I, I'm not a preacher. No, no, no. This, this word for preacher, you study this out, is not mean a person with four years at a, 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 an accreditation degree or whatever degree with something, things on his wall. He's not talking about someone who's been ordained. The word preacher just means a herald. What's a herald? A herald's a messenger who was, who was given an announcement from the king to go out and tell everybody that. So this idea of giving the gospel isn't just for the pastor or the staff or someone who's ordained. It's for all of us because we've all been given the great commission from Christ, which is to go out into all the world and to give the gospel. So this idea, how are people going to hear? It's going to be because we are being the preachers we should be, isn't it? That, that's what's going to have to happen. And this is a privilege, by the way. It's, it is a privilege. I know sometimes we can be ashamed of the gospel. We, we can not think it's a privilege. I know as a teenager, I struggle with that, going to school, thinking, man, I'm supposed to give the gospel, but this is, this is embarrassing. And you can have that mindset, but, but Paul looks at it like a privilege. Look what he says in verse 15, the second half. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. See, see Paul looks at this this. Uh, this opportunity we have to give the gospel as a beautiful thing. And it is because the moment that you got saved, remember that, think back to this, you went from an eternity in hell to an eternity in heaven. Why? All because a person was willing to take the time to tell you the gospel. And in that moment that you accepted the gospel, your life was fundamentally transformed. It's a special thing. It's it's a unique thing. You can't recreate this anywhere. And that's why Paul says it's beautiful. Because when you share the gospel with the person, you are sharing one of the most powerful things this world could ever hear, the power of God on the salvation. You got to buy that. It is. But if your experience is like mine, not everyone that you share the gospel with accepts it, do they? And not everyone you share the gospel with, not only do they not accept it, they adamantly reject it. And it frustrates them and they're, they're angry about it. But can you believe that such beautiful news, the gospel, can you believe that such powerful news, it's the power of God on the salvation, can you believe that they would reject that? Can you believe that such simple news that even a child can understand it, can you believe that, that so many more of that believe when they hear it? And you know what? When we look at what the scripture says about the gospel, and then we look at our experience, it, it can almost make us believe maybe it's not as powerful as I thought. Because if it is the power of God, it seems like it should have an impact. But every time I go to my boss or this person, they reject it. What is going on here? It may be, make you begin to wonder if it really is that way. And if that's you, that's been me, feel, feel at peace in some ways because, you know, that's how Isaiah felt too. If you look at verse 16 of the chapter, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? 
You see, see I, Isaiah is, is, is frustrated about this as well because if you remember with Isaiah in chapter 6, he, he sees God in his glory. He sees his train from the temple. He's so moved by what he sees of God and his majesty and the angels and the cherubims that Isaiah says, hey, I, I'll send your message. I'll go out and I'll give your message. If, you, if you'll send me, I'll do it. So God does. And Isaiah goes out and he gives the message right from the mouth of God. He goes to that town and this town. He goes to these people. And you know what? When you get to chapter 53 of Isaiah, do you know what Isaiah's comments are about this? Lord, who is believed? You know what Isaiah's basically saying is it's, it's almost like it didn't matter. Isaiah, it's almost like Isaiah was saying this, Lord, I went to that town and to that town. I went at that time and to that person. And I gave the message that you gave me to give. But as I gave it to the people, nothing happened. I thought this is the power of God. I thought this was to make an impact. And Isaiah is frustrated because he doesn't see a difference. Say, well, well, why would God send Isaiah to a people that weren't receptive? Why would God send Isaiah in the first place if he knew that? Well, look at verse 17. And this is really the reason. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see what he's doing there? Paul is explaining this is why a person hears, even if they don't want to, because the only chance for a person to come to salvation is the hearing of the word of God. So that if there, if there is going to be a chance for a person to come to faith, it's going to be because they heard the word of God. You see, that's, that, 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 that motivates us, that moves us to do something, even that may not look logical, because we know if, if we withhold the gospel from a person, then we're removing the chance for them to come to salvation. We're taking that away. If there's ever a chance for a person to come to faith, we understand this, it's going to be because of the hearing the word of God. And that's how God designed it, by the way. That's how he designed it. I'll, I'll give you two examples real quick. You, if, you, if you're in the book of Acts, chapter 10, there's a, a great example of Cornelius. Bible says he was a devout man. He feared God with all his house. He gave much alms. He was probably a, a, a better Gentile than some of the Jews were in, in his religion. He was probably better than some of them. They respected him. And you know what? God responded to Cornelius seeking for him. God responded to that. Well, what did God do? Well, God sends an angel to him and he tells him, hey, um, you need to go find a man named Peter because he's going to tell you what you need to do. Why would he have to do that? Well, because he wasn't saved, just because he was seeking God sincerely. That, that wasn't the issue. So he sends for Peter. Well, meanwhile, Peter's on the other side of town having a, a crazy dream, if you remember, about a, a sheet coming out of heaven with wild beasts and creeping things, and he's told to eat all this stuff, and Peter's like, this is weird. I'm not going to do that. It, the po point is, while that's happening, these two men come to find Peter. Peter goes back. He finds Cornelius, and as they begin to talk, Peter understands, here's what's going on, and he tells him in verse 43 of Acts chapter 10, to him give all the prophets witness, listen, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Now notice that Peter did not say Cornelius. Listen, man, God has noticed that you're a sincere guy. I mean, you didn't even grow up a Jew. You don't have any of this understanding. It's like you grew up on an island, basically, when it came to the oracles of God and all these things. Listen, you're sincere. You're doing the best you can. You're even outdoing some of my people. And so you're, God's already accepted you. It's not what he said, is it? No. He said, um, if you're going to come to the God that you're seeking, here's how you do it. It's through his name. That's what he was told. You go to the next chapter, in chapter 11 of Acts, when Peter is recounting this, this, uh, this story to the other apostles and their minds are, are blown away that God is opening this door of faith to the Gentiles. He tells them this in verse 14, um, I was to tell him words whereby his, thou, thou, thou and thy, all thy house shall be saved. So he's telling them, listen, I had to tell them that because that's how he was going to come to salvation. Now, here's the question. Wouldn't it have been easier if the angel that came to him in the first place just told him, hey, Cornelius, you're looking for God. Here's what you got to do. You don't think the angel knew? You don't think the angel, they were at the temple? I mean, they were, at, they were at the tomb when he was risen. They, they understood what was going on. Here. Well, why didn't the angel tell him? Because God didn't design it that way. God designed it for this, that if they're going to hear, it's going to be because of a preacher. It's going to be because of a messenger. That's how God designed it. Cornelius had to hear the message. And to hear the message, Peter had to be, preach it to him. And to preach it, God sent him. And it was after Cornelius heard, then faith came. It was just one other one. How about the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, right? 
Remember how he is uh, on the chariot that he's going through that deserted area? He's reading Isaiah 53 about the Messiah, and he did not understand until when? Well, God took Philip out of that revival, sent him to the middle of nowhere, which made no logical sense, but God had a plan. He sent him there. He comes up alongside, and he says, hey, um, do you understand what you're reading? And here's what he said. How can I, except some man, should guide me? See, this is the New Testament pattern we see in Acts. Well, okay, someone's seeking God. Is that good enough? No, it's not. Well, if someone's seeking, what's God going to do? Well, here's a promise God made. Um, if you'll seek me, you will find me. So all these cannibals and all these islands and all these deserted areas, what does God do with these people? He's not willing they should perish. And so what he does is he sends preachers to them to give them the gospel. Well, they're not accepting it. I know, but he still sends them because that is the justice. They must hear the gospel to respond to it. This is how this works. The simple fact is many are ready to be saved. What do they need? They need someone to tell them. That's what they need. But you might think, what about the rest, though? What, what about those in our town? That, what about my grandma, my uncle? What about them that, that they've heard and they've rejected? What do we do with that? Well, if that is hard for you to, to, to grasp, Paul goes one step farther because that may be extreme, but what about Israel? Right? I mean, we think it's amazing that a Gentile would, accept the, would reject the gospel. What about the Jew? What about God's own hand-picked people that were given abundant revelation, that were given the prophets, were given the law? They were hand-picked. How did they reject all this too? Isn't that more astounding than us? It absolutely is. And that's what Paul's going to deal with in verse 18 to 21. Paul is going to lay out that there are only three possible reasons that Israel did not believe. And those are the same three we see today. Look at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Okay, so that's the first reason. Well, what would be the first reason that, that people would be lost? Well, they haven't heard yet. And we saw that in verse 14, didn't we? How, should, how can they call on him, right? They haven't heard of him yet. So Paul's going to apply this to Israel to see how this works out. Um, have, ha, have, they not, ha, have they not heard? Well, what is Paul's answer to that? Look at the rest of the verse. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. You know what Paul's doing is Paul is quoting from Psalm 19, where it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork day into day out of his speech and night into night. You say, to, to what extent does God's revealing, does God's light about himself go? To, how far does it go? Not just to Israel. It says, it says there is no speech in verse 3 of 19, chapter 19, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's, that's what Paul's saying. What he's saying is just base level, all of humanity has enough light to know there's a creator. This is super consistent with what Paul's saying here. They all know that. There's, that's the extent of it. All know, but Israel even more. Isn't that right? Israel even more than that. So it's okay. So what was their problem? Look at verse 19. So they knew, they had heard, look at verse 19, but I say, did not Israel know? Okay, so, so maybe Israel had heard, but maybe they didn't understand, right? Maybe they didn't comprehend it. Isn't that, isn't that how we look at Catholics and Pentecostals? And it's like they just don't understand yet. So, so what, how does God look at that? Well, well, we're dealing with Israel here. What is his answer? First, Moses saith, I will revoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. And I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Now, what Paul is doing by quoting those verses is he is establishing the fact. He goes back as early as Moses, all the way up to the prophet Isaiah. And he's making the case by doing that, that Israel had been well informed about God's intentions about this. That Israel knew this. And they had seen at different times God do this. They had seen Tamar come to faith. They had seen Rahab come to faith. They had seen Ruth come to faith. And Bathsheba, who were they? They were Gentiles. They're outside of Israel that God had grafted and that God had brought in to Israel. And then you get to Jonah, right? Why did Jonah not want to go to Nineveh? Because he knew that God would be merciful, didn't he? Is that's what he says. He says, I knew you were a patient God. I knew you were merciful. And he knew that God would give them the mercy and he didn't want that to happen, did he? And no, and that's what he's saying is, no, they knew. They understood what God was trying to do and they didn't like it. 
So yeah, of course they knew. So what's the issue? Verse 21. But to Israel, he saith, all day long, I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. You say, how is God reaching out to the people all that time? The prophets was God reaching out to them. John the Baptist was God reaching out to them. Christ's coming was God reaching out to them. Then when Christ was here, he made statements about himself being the bread and the life and the way and the truth and the door. And he made these statements about himself. What was he doing? He was reaching out to his people. But when you look at what happened, fundamentally, they rejected him, didn't they? He even stands near the end. He says, hey, how often would I have gathered you? But ye would not. See, that was the issue. The issue is they didn't want to come to him. And that's still true today, isn't it? And you know what? In either of the three cases, whether people have heard, whether they understand, or whether they even want it, they're going to spend an eternity in a devil's hell. But God's not willing they should perish. See, this is where we can get stuck with Calvinism, all kinds of weird stuff. Listen, God's not willing they should perish, so what did God do? God came up with a way to get the gospel to them, and that way is us. That way is for us to feel the burden, is for us to take that to them. And we have no way of knowing who's going to respond to the gospel. I understand that. And who reject it. But we do know this. We cannot expect them to respond to something they've never heard. They haven't had a chance yet. And I understand that many don't believe because they don't want to, but I want to submit to you today that there is something even more tragic than when a person out and out rejects the gospel. And that is when a person would have accepted the gospel, but they didn't get a chance to. Say, well, well, that's not going to happen. Well, why missions then? If God's going to wave a magic wand, why, why missions? Why does this matter? This is why it matters because we're guilty. And we have to hear salvation is through his name. But you might think again, well, what about those that don't want to hear? Well, what do we do with my uncle? What do we do with my aunt? What do we do with those people that don't want to hear? Um, verse 17, faith cometh by, by hearing. Well, how are they going to hear? The word of God. They got to get the word of God. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what not to do. Um, stop giving them the gospel. That, that'd be a mistake, wouldn't it? But I think that's our temptation, isn't it? Our temptation when someone does reject is to say, well, I mean, it's been 15 times, so it's probably not going to make a difference. I've been there. I mean, if you've ever been there, even some family, I'm like, well, I've already done this so many times. They just get frustrated. Why would I do it again? Because if I don't do that, then I'm eliminating another opportunity for faith to happen, am I, am I not? Absolutely. Of course, use wisdom and use discernment, right? Use those things. But, but couldn't it be that God is stirring up some of you, maybe even right now, this very moment, because there's a Cornelius somewhere looking? They're seeking, and God wants to draw them. So what is he going to do? He's going to send a messenger to give them the gospel. That's how it's going to work. I believe that the reason why God would bring up names in our minds and God would bring up a person on our heart, why? Is because they got, that is God reaching out to his people to offer them the gospel, isn't it? It's not an accident that God would burden you for a person. It's not an accident that God would do those kind of things. He's doing that because he wants to offer them grace. I found that to be true so many times. Say, they all get saved. No, 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 no. But it may be 20 times they have to hear the gospel. And I may be number 15, right? When we do that, all we're doing is we're watering the seed, aren't we? Uh, you know, I, I, my, my realtor, I mentioned it in my video. What if I hadn't told my realtor again? I mean, seven and a half years later, in that span of time, God had worked on his life. He had rejected the gospel as much as you could when I gave him the, the first time. But seven and, a half years or, seven and a half years later, I could have went with the assumption, well, you know, it's probably not any different. And I'd have been wrong. Listen, God prompted me to give the gospel, and I did, and he came to Christ then. Seven and a half years later, how many times had he heard the gospel? 20 times? In that meantime, I have no idea how many times, but, but, but I know this. What if I were to know in my mind, well, he's already heard the gospel 20 times between then and now, so he's rejected every time, so it's probably pointless, right? I wouldn't have given him the gospel probably. I'm glad I didn't know that, and God worked despite all those things. I may not have told him, but thank God I did. You know, I believe the reason why we're going to Brazil is because Tom Brewer had been praying for eight years for God to send a couple there. That's why we're going to Brazil. I know that for sure. That's how God works. So is God burdening you with somebody? Is God bringing somebody back to your mind? I want to encourage you. It might be that you've gotten rejected after rejection and it has made you begin to feel like it's pointless. But listen, giving the gospel is never pointless. It may not be that they come to faith at that point, 
but you're still watering the seed. And so let me ask you this as we close out. Your neighbors, have they heard from you yet? Not, not pastor. I said, have they heard the gospel from you? And if so, when's the last time they heard it? Again, use the sermon. But when's the last time they heard it? Your classmates, have they heard the gospel? Your coworkers, have they heard the gospel? Well, they've rejected it. I mean, I know, they, and, and they need to hear it again. They need to hear it again. How much of your week last week included the gospel in it? I just think about that. I know we're in COVID. I know it's crazy. I know this is weird, but we, we're really creative. How much of your week have you gotten the gospel to a person? Through text or through, through video? So, some way, have, have you got the gospel to people? Because listen, this is a life or death situation. And it hinges on, on what? Well, God doesn't want them to perish. So what is he going to do? He's going to send me and you. Some will go across the sea, but some he's going to send across the street or across the place at work. But that's the issue. So I know this is kind of different, but wherever you're at, if you could just have a, a spirit of prayer with me this evening, just go to a spirit of prayer. Maybe you bow your head where you're at. I know it's kind of different, but so I think that sentiment is there. And just be transparent with God right now. How much of your life is about the gospel? At what points is it about the gospel? And is God burdening you for a place or for a person? It's not an accident. We see in scripture that when people are seeking God, he's made a promise that they will find him. And, he, and we find him through us, his preachers. So if you could we'll pray right now. Father, thank you so much for the, the time we've had together in the Word. And I, I just pray that it would be an encouragement. I know in my life, we can tend to be ashamed of the gospel. We can tend to limit the gospel. But Father, uh, when we do that, we're really eliminating the possibility of a person coming to salvation. Help us not to do that. Help us to have the boldness we need. We have been given a spirit of fear, Father. And may we pray for those that are lost, that it would hit our hearts in a way we could see what Psalm 126 talks about, that they that weep, that they'll come again doubtless rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them. Father, help us to have the kind of heart we need to about the gospel. In Christ's name, amen. This time I'll turn over to Pastor. Let's have a moment of invitation time. Some of you have maybe already spent some time in prayer uh, with Brother Schmidt's um, call to action there. Uh, what a tremendous message that was and, and a timely message. We need to hear this uh, more now than, than we ever have before. It's such a, such a, uh, a pivotal time, a pivotal moment in our churches and in our nation. And people are, are uh, looking for answers right now. Many people looking for hope right now. And, and Christians, we need, to, we need to rise up and, and uh, commit to being faithful to the call uh, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ has commissioned all of us with, not just pastors, not just uh, the deacons and, and church leaders and Sunday school teachers, but each and every one of us are supposed to be telling others. And that was a, a tremendous message that we heard tonight. But uh, maybe... Families get together, or those of you that are watching at home, uh, there in the comfort of your home, uh, get get down on your knees right now, or or just bow your heads right now, and spend some time with the Lord and, and talk to Him about this area in your life. Are you doing what you should be doing? And let's just spend a few moments in an attitude of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the message that we heard and, and uh, spoke to my heart. I thank you, Lord, for how clear the, the truth uh, 
of your word is and how clearly it was presented in that message. And I, I just pray that it would affect our folks back at home. And Lord, that we would be soft to it. How shall they hear without a preacher? We need to ask ourselves that question. God, I pray that it would change us and prompt us and motivate us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing. Thank you, Lord, for it. We pray that you would bless tonight as we are dismissed in the service. In, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That, uh, that concludes uh, the service. Um, and uh, actually, we are going to have an offering in, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, challenge you, church members, to continue uh, to be faithful, uh, to, to join in on the, the services. And, uh, and concerning uh, Brother Michael and his family, would you commit to praying for them? Would you commit right now uh, to, to praying for them as they continue their deputation and as they uh, seek to get to the, the field of Brazil? And, uh, God, and, and would you pray that God would bless them and keep them safe on their way? Then also, uh, as, we, as we give in the offering tonight, uh, would would you uh, give give something towards uh, uh, brother Michael Schmidt and the family there? And uh, you can uh, put that. You can if you're going to give by tithely, uh, you can you can give special and then the special offering category, and that'll go towards them. Uh, or if you send it in uh, and in by mail or bring it in, uh, just uh, make that out to uh, Lakewood Baptist Temple and and in the uh, in the little note area, right in uh, missionary or Michael Schmidt, and uh, and that will uh, go to them. Uh, but I appreciate him. I appreciate uh, he, he and his family uh, answering the call uh, to do what the Lord has called them to do. And now they need churches to back them up uh, by prayer and financial support. So let's uh, let's commit to doing that. We're going to have an offering in just a moment, and uh, and so. Uh, we'll go ahead and and get ready for that, and let's be faithful to give. All right, now it's an opportunity for us to give. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and like I said, if you'd like to give in the love offering towards our missionaries tonight, you can do so, and uh, we'll do that at this time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give. We pray that you would use it for your honor and for your glory, and uh, Lord, I pray that our folks would be involved in giving to the mission work that was presented this evening, and uh, may it be a blessing to our missionaries. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give to, towards servants of yours. And uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, that the fact that we can only give because you've given to us. We pray that you bless the offering now in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>